Well, thanks very much for inviting me uh, along to the ACFA Field Archaeology or Archaeology for All. I'm especially pleased to see so many of you here tonight on such a bonny day, and I think it's lovely all over Scotland, and I believe you're all from all over Scotland, so I think uh, perhaps this uh, represents the, the real interest uh, in uh, archaeology and in, and in Brochs, moreover. So thank you for coming. Normally this talk would be provided by myself, uh, a co-founder of the Caithness Brock Project, and Ian McLean, who you can see on the right hand side there. Um, we just have both great taste and jumpers, that's all I like to say about this photograph. A little bit about myself very quickly. Um, I've always been interested in archaeology. You can see a picture of myself here from maybe 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago perhaps. Uh, at Scara Bray, back when you could actually manoeuvre and navigate through the kind of warren of dry stone uh, structures which you can find there. Uh, and to my abject horror, when I did actually procure these photographs, I noticed that I was, yes, indeed wearing an England rugby top. So I'm not quite sure why that was. Um, and just make no doubt about it, I am a S Scotland rugby fan, especially now that they're quite good at rugby. So um, that's just to clear that up. Uh, moving on from that, I would go, uh, go kind of, um, kind of chase my archaeological passions a little bit in 2015 after a six to seven year stint in a call centre. Uh, I worked in Orkney and I worked at the Ness of Brodger site where I made this really fantastic uh, groove where box shared find, which they actually showed on the, the guides, which uh, I was really proud of. Um, funnily enough, when I moved to Orkney in 2015, it was voted the most romantic place in Britain uh, by Nelson Booth. Just that, that's a real fact. You can look that up. I don't know if that's co coincidence or not. Um, this would, and I would go to university eventually, at the grand old age of 27, to study archaeology at Glasgow University. Uh, and I was fortunate, fortunate enough to take part in several digs. Perhaps the most interesting or noteworthy was the excavation in Kosovo, where we're excavating a Roman settlement, a Roman settlement. Um, Bresnik, uh, and I made quite quite possibly the find of a lifetime, which is the this beautiful Roman brooch. It's a crossbow brooch, kind of onion-headed crossbow brooch. So a really fantastic experience, and I owe that all to to archaeology. Ian, at this point, would say that he's been in this project for so long that he has now lost most of his hair. So um, we'll just move on from there. Uh, so this is all about the Caithness Brock project. Uh, perhaps some of you have heard of us or seen us on social media, on the news, on newspapers. Uh, we are an archaeological charity based in Caithness, probably enough. But we're going to start at the start and we're going to discuss what a Brock is. Now, I think there's quite a few learned individuals in here tonight. So quite often when I'm giving these talks, it can be to a variety of organisations who know what, who really don't even know what archaeology entails. So I'm quite happy to discuss what a brock is, but we're going to fire through this because I think most of you will have a good idea as to what a brock is. So we're going to step into our time machine. We're going to go back to the Iron Age. That's roughly 2,000 years ago, two, 2,000 years ago to 2,500 years ago. And this is the time of the brock. Also dunes, which were mentioned in the preamble um, uh, by Simon there earlier. Uh, but we're talking about brocks because... Where I'm from, brocks are king, and Caithness has more brocks than anywhere else in the world. Technically, Scotland, because brocks are unique, they're endemic to Scotland. But Caithness is roughly 180 to 200 brocks, perhaps a little bit higher, perhaps a little lower. Of course, not all of them have been investigated, and of course, it depends on what you define a brock as. So, a little bit about brock origins. Brocks were at one point in time thought to be a, thought to have been a contribution from uh, the Vikings from, from the Danes there, they, they were thought to have also been Pictish houses, which is slightly erroneous in terms of, in terms of timing, because they appear to develop out of uh, our, our own vernacular tradition of building rounded structures. So it starts with round houses, and it moves through to kind of more progressively more and more monumental structures, as you can see here in this slide, which I have absolutely stolen from one of my Glasgow University lecturers, but I thought it summed it up quite nicely as to the development of brocks. So you can see that brocks perhaps start, the kind of monumental structures start to develop, you know, the, the, the start of the Iron Age, tail end of the, of the Bronze Age, but it's really towards the turn of the millennium, uh, the last millennium, sorry, where 
where blocks as we might envisage them start to appear. So I'm talking about the likes of Musa, which will of course come up in a little bit. But here's an example of a hut circle, as you can see here. Now they leave very little in terms of uh, the archaeological record. They are largely made from uh, you know, wattle and daub, perhaps some uh, turf of some description, thatching, uh, perhaps some wood joists and timbers, very much organic materials which don't stand the test of time. We might describe some of these as Atlantic roundhouses, but Atlantic roundhouses are generally more, um, uh, again, as I say, larger stone structures. And one of the earliest that, uh, of, of these types is Bubroch on Orkney, um, which I'm not sure you can really visit anymore, actually. It's either that or Howbroch, which was kind of demolished, essentially. Uh, but you can see here, these are quite thick walled, looking at least um, a few metres thick uh, in terms of stone. Uh, walling. Uh, then we move into complex Atlantic roundhouses, and these are terms coined by the archaeologist and Brock, real Brock enthusiast Ian Armit. Some of you may have read his story, uh, Towers of the North, uh, sorry, his book rather, Towers of the North, which is a really excellent introduction, I find, to, to Brock and, and fairly readable as well. It's too uh, filled with jargon. Uh, when we get to complex Atlantic roundhouses, we think about the internal arrangements of Brock's. Uh, starting to develop. So we start to see staircases developing in between the walls so that there are now, now two walls. Uh, between the two walls is known uh, a, a gallery runs through this, which is uh, uh, really quite a complex um, and ingenious means to, to build structures. Um, it's quite complex, as you might imagine. But add to that complexity, you have cells being built in blocks as well. So they weren't just um, uh, just content with with making this a monumental structure, they were building structures within structures here almost. And um, Crosskirk Brock is an excellent example of this. It dates to around about 400 BC, 200 BC. Uh, unfortunately, you definitely can't visit this anymore because it was bulldozed off the edge of a cliff in the 1970s. I believe for safety reasons. And then we come to the, the zenith of of Brock building, which is the Brock Tower, which I'm sure you are familiar with or may have seen some some pictures of. And we're talking about Musa, for instance, or Duntel, Dun, Duntrodden, um, Duncarloway, all of which you can find kind of on, on the west western side of Scotland. But Musa stands alone as one of the, the well, as the best example of a brock and the one that only really survives to its uh, surviving height, although there was some meddling with it at some point in time. Um, but it's really a supreme example. And to my, to my great shame, I've never visited, hopefully one day. So just some common features about Brocks. We have the, the, the two walls, which I mentioned before, and you can see the void or the gallery rather that runs between those two walls. Um, forming a kind of batter, if you like, where one wall is kind of almost pressed against the other wall and that helps to support it. Um, here you can see an example of that gallery and the two walls that's done. Oh, I'm going to get this wrong. It's done trodden in, uh, in Glen Elg. It's one of the Glen Elg Brocks, certainly. It's the one that's slightly higher up the Glen. Again, I'm talking about the kind of the, the ground kind of um, plan, if you like, of brocks. Most brocks, you know, they, they fit a similar pattern where they have cells, where they have these staircases, and they are roughly about the same size as opposed to dunes, which are quite uh, variable in their size and scale, uh, and also their shape too. You get a number of kind of oblong, strangely shaped dunes, whereas brocks are more regular in their in their um, uh, in their sizing and shapes. But, but when it comes to everything uh, above kind of ground archaeology, it becomes a bit more mishmash and a bit more difficult to understand. And a case in point here is the roof, where we really don't know, first of all, whether Brocks were roofed, but I would ask our esteemed colleagues today if they would live in a house in Scotland without a roof. Probably not. Perhaps in summer it's quite nice, but I wouldn't uh, like to live there in winter. But in terms of how that Brock looked, how it fitted on top of the structure, we're really not quite sure, but this is part of the reason why we started Caithness Brock Project. Uh, but as I was explaining, most brocks kind of fit a similar pattern, a similar, um, a similar design. Um, you can see how they're at the bottom left is kind of very early stage brock with very little internal arrangements. Um, whereas we get to the likes of Gurness, which has a really complex structure alongside brock villages. Several brocks stand by themselves and they follow a pattern on the west coast and Sutherland, uh, Western Isles. Um, Wester Ross, where they are these kind of standalone towers. But when it comes to Caithness, Orkney and Shetland, you find that these are that Brock villages um, develop either around or at the same time, or perhaps even before the Brock is developed, 
Uh, I think more work is required just of these structures of these villages that uh, can be found around several blocks in the kind of north, far north Isles in the far north of Scotland, if they are indeed contemporaneous with the Brock Tower. So there's some interesting um, insights into Brock here. So yeah, but we're, we're talking about the Keith S. Brock project tonight, and I'll try and tell you a little bit about that. So this is what we want to do. There we go, as we show you around what we're trying to do, which is essentially we're trying to construct a replica broch, the first of its kind in roughly 2,000 years. So no small beer. Various aims and ethos behind, the, uh, behind this project. Uh, one of these is the experimental archaeological aim, which is to really try to understand how brochs were built and perhaps why they were built through the action of actually doing it. Uh, Jimmy, I've seen um, a couple of similar projects, perhaps, um, from Sir Ancient Farm in England to Gedelon in France, which is a, an amazing project. And we drew a huge amount of inspiration from that, given its kind of the, uh, the kind of scale of its ambition. Um, and some of you may be familiar or were familiar, perhaps, with the Scottish Cranach Centre, uh, again, who we look up to in, in, in many ways for, for what they managed to achieve and how they managed to keep things, pe people interested and engaged. A really brilliant project which I, I couldn't um, talk highly enough about. Um, good to see that they are going to be back in the next, well next year I hope actually, so do visit if you can, which is on Loch Tay by the way. Um, the second aspect that we like to look at is the promotion and preservation of traditional skills. Uh, dry stone diking, the flagstone industry, were such important skills uh, and trades and industries to Caithness, but nowadays you, you can count on a, less than a handful of uh, dry stone dikers who are present in the area. Uh, and without them passing on their skills, then this is something that may be lost to Caithness forever. And that, that would be a great shame. And we think that a 40 foot block tower would really help to highlight the skills required and the, the industry of, of um, dry stone diking and the flagstone uh, industries as well, which we are actually seeing a lot of resurgence of actually in the area. Um, on top of that, though, there's plenty of other traditional skills which you can involve. You can have thatching, joinery, weaving, cooking, smelting a sword, all sorts, all sorts of things that you can engage the public with. And that's really what we want to do. We want to engage the public. We want to uh, inspire the public to visit Caithness because we want them to come and visit Caithness. Uh, we see that heritage tourism as being a, a, an important part of the future of Caithness as well. And what better way to highlight the, the real wealth of sites and uh, monuments that we have in the county by showing them something that we, we are very proud of and uh, really reflects Caithness as the home of the book as well. So um, just to let you know that is um, just a little kind of a brief introduction to the project and what we're trying to achieve. It's just, just good to note as well that it's not just myself and Ian who are responsible for the project. We are ably supported supported by a number of volunteers, uh, because this is a volunteer organisation uh, based mainly in Caithness, but we have volunteers in England at the moment and Glasgow and Edinburgh. Uh, and they are really all quite valuable and really hard working bunch of people. So I'd just like to thank them all for, for helping us out. So we're going to go quickly back to why we're doing this though, um, which is a, a, an important question to ask yourself every day if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're heading a project such as this. Well, 
does anyone recognize what this is? I always like asking the question. Please do let, speak up if you know. Dune Ray. Absolutely, well done. Um, every, usually every, everyone gets this, and I'm perhaps surprised by how many people know about Dune Ray. It's, it's one of the kind of uh, emblems of Caithness, along with Caithness glass, which is no longer in Caithness. So it's quite sad to see because this is uh, the nuclear power plant um, built in the 1950s, one of the, the first prototype uh, fast reactor in the country, in, in the UK, in fact, and it's now going through a process of being decommissioned. And I like this image on the right here because it kind of highlights or summarises what's going on in Caithness just now, the, the tourist um, uh, industry just passing us by somewhat. Um, and you can see how important Doonery is and has been to the county. It accounts for roughly one in five jobs in Caithness. It contributes £68 million to the local economy each year, and there's roughly 1,200 um, employees at Doonery presently. Some people have um, suggested that Doonery could be closed by 2036. I don't think that's quite so true, but it's, it's going to happen perhaps in my lifetime, perhaps in the, the lifetime of uh, the next generation. Um, and that's quite worrying because that has led to quite drastic population drop projections from the Highland Council. You'll see that Caithness in the next 20 years is potentially going to lose 20 over 20% of its population. And I can't think of anywhere else which has gone through a population decline in that quick a time um, in recent history, um, and perhaps even in you know, uh, older history than that too. Um, be careful of statistics because the Highland Council would say, if, as the Highlands as a whole, uh, the population is going to grow, and that's largely because of the increase uh, expected in, in Inverness. But Caithness is, is, is looking rather worrying there, if you ask me. So we, myself and Ian, we looked north to, uh, you know, heritage inspiration, and of course Orkney has done rather well out of its archaeological past and its archaeological landscape. It makes about £67 million, pounds, in fact, from tourism. And from that, uh, tourism, rough, over half uh, the visitors came for history and culture, uh, whereas a third came for uh, archaeology. And I would suspect that people would, would lump history and archaeology into the same thing. So, so it's a really important factor in driving people and motivating people. This is my number one, sorry for visiting Orkney, but this is my number one reason for visiting Orkney, and that is the Gurness cat, which you can find, of course, at a um, Brilliant wee chap. Um, it's not just Orkney, of course, who do well out of their heritage tourism industry. Uh, the Western Isles, for instance, uh, it's, it's been suggested that it makes up roughly £4 million from heritage tourism, or that archaeology contributes £4 million towards heritage tourism. And I, I, I did this talk last week for the Lather and WRI, and I was asking them, you know, what, what, what makes Caithness an attractive place for tourists? You know, is it the scenery? Is it the food and drink, is it the kind of peace and quiet? How many how many people actually consider the archaeology and history? Because again, Caithness has a real wealth of sites. Um, and I showed this map, which is an OS map, and you might be able to notice some docks and perhaps a castle or a chamber care. But look how many historic sites uh, noted by Canmore there are. They were really impressed by by the kind of depth, wealth of history that can, and archaeology that can be found in the county. In fact, there we go, there's a kind of uh, wider map there for you. Um, which I, I think probably needs to be updated, actually. There's probably a lot more than these sites would suggest. Of course, it's not about the, the wealth of, of, it's not about the number of, of archaeological sites, and it's, it's kind of hard to put a kind of quantitative, qualitative spin on things. But it just goes to show that Caithness has a really um, rich archaeological landscape. Uh, but that's been difficult, I think, for a lot of people to get on board with, frankly, because Caithness is the lowlands beyond the highlands. It has... Uh, a somewhat kind of dual reputation as a flat, sparse landscape. Last week, I took someone out to uh, John O'Groats, and it was a beautiful bluebird day. It was not a cloud in the sky, a beautiful view of Orkney. We'd just been to a lovely walk along the coast, and I asked for her, her impressions of Caithness, and she said, yeah, it's, it's a bit sparse. So it, it's quite um, daunting, actually, to, to consider Caithness as as being uh, not on the tourist radar when we have so many archaeological sites. But this is something that is kind of historic. You know, the Visit Scotland, Active in Scotland book, it has one sentence dedicated to Caithness. Um, historic Environment Scotland don't really have a presence here in Caithness uh, either. Um, 
a few years ago as well, Visit Scotland ran a uh, kind of competition or a, a more of a kind of um, public um, invitation for people to send in photographs of Scotland. And out of the, and I, I'm sad, I'm a very sad individual and I will count through um, hundreds of photographs. Out of the 200 plus photographs that they had from across Scotland, uh, how many were of Caithness? Zero. And then when I checked again a few years later, in, in over 800, they had two pictures of Caithness. And that's our, that's our um, governing body, that's our kind of national body who are responsible for promoting Caithness. You know, this is something, you know, that is, even John Thurzo recognises, the, the chairman of Visit Scotland, a uh, Caithnesian. He says, a particular bet noir of the Scottish tourism industry is to cut the map off. Yes, and I think that is quite resonant with a lot of Caithness inhabitants. Um, and here's just another, another quote which I use to kind of um, um, evidence this as well. Sorry, Caithness, but now having photographed in every county of mainland Britain, I find you the most impressive of them. So, not great. I always like to refer to as well the fact that this is quite a historic view. Um, the fact that Caithness has been um, uh, viewed as a, as a kind of flat, bleak country, um, but also the, the, the women folk of Caithness. In George Lowe's 1774 Travels Through Scotland and Shetland, he describes the women of Stroma. Uh, in fact, he first of all describes the men as hardy, stout spadesmen, but the women that, while young, grow tolerably well looked, but as they advance in age, they grow, they grow, um, they acquire a peculiar ghastliness about their countenances. So I don't think he's welcome back to Stroma. So this is something that I took a great interest in, uh, is the kind of the tourist aspect or the tourist side of archaeology. Um, my final year dissertation at Glasgow University, which I had done a few years ago, and, and I kind of estimated that the potential value of archaeology, and that's the economic value, uh, as around six and a half million pounds. There was also a whole slew of benefits in terms of mental health and um, education and pride of place and physical well-being as well, which I also looked at. And if anyone is really interested, I can all send on um, a dissertation, hoping to publish that later this year. Uh, but we'll get to that. So how did we start? Well, I travel into our time machine again as we we travel to the distant past to the year 2013. So here we are, here's my time machine. Here's me and Ian. So we really started this project in 2013. I worked in a call center. I didn't have a uh, qualification, a, a university qualification to my name, neither did Ian. Um, he was a self-employed builder. We just had a, a shared interest in archeology span and promoting Caithness, making the most of Caithness. We really believe that Caithness deserved it. And we really started as a Facebook page, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with social media, but memes and making you know, irreverence goes down very well on, on social media. And so that's the way that we wanted to, to go about it, because archaeology has been for a certain type of person, uh, a certain standing of person, and, and even a certain age of person for such a long time. But we were really keen to try and engage with, with as many people from as many different backgrounds as possible. And so social media or Facebook even was a really good vehicle for that. Um, and I think we that this sums us up. Live laugh brocks. That just sums up our social media. Uh, and the one thing I learned about social media was that if you post anything to do with archaeology and cats, uh, it's likely to go pretty viral. So there's a little happy thing for you there as far as social media. That's the standing stone at history, by the way. Uh, I love that cat. But we, you know, we engage the public through more traditional means, so the small screen. Um, some of you may, may recognise this face and Doogie Vipond. Uh, we appeared on BBC Landward in 2016, I think, and I'm actually going to appear on BBC Landward next Friday, or next Thursday, sorry. So if you want to see me talking about the John O'Groats Trail, do tune in. Um, if there is one piece of advice I have to give about appearing on television, though, dealing with the uh, with, with fame and the pratfalls of fame, uh, it is do not Google yourself after you appeared on television. So this is on, on a certain website. Just notice the picture here. Why is Dougie Vipon speaking with one of the Jedward twins? So just in case you need a reminder, that is Jedward. Uh, there's me. I don't think I look anything like one of the Jedward twins. At least I, I like to think I don't. 
Uh, I'd actually watched this as I was crossing over to Orkney, I think, just to catch up with some friends, and my phone started buzzing uh, on my on my phone. Um, and as I answered it, I just saw a whole host of text messages coming through, all relating to Doogie Vipon's face as he, I was driving him in my car. There is a face of real fear, apparently. So we then sort of moved on from social media to more uh, physical, um, more real world projects. So we started off with a, in 2015 with a, um, a kind of leaflet and interpretation panel project. We, the, the, this, this was actually acquired through funding from a public pitching competition, which was attended by roughly 120 members of the public. The trick here was to bring along your a whole clan of uh, your, your friends and family and we didn't do that. We actually only brought maybe five or six people with us. Uh, there were about 10 or so teams there. Um, and so I think that was a fairly fair competition actually in the end. But we came out of that vote with 80% of the vote. And I really thought we, were, we didn't stand a chance actually because we were up against the likes of uh, age concern charities, children's sports groups, mental health groups. But I think the, the fact that we came out of that with 80% of the vote really reflects that people in Caithness also want to see some change and some positive movement in terms of the how we use and utilise our archaeological environment. So moving on from that, we uh, established the, the, the Lego Broch. I'm not sure if anyone managed to visit if they've been up in Caithness in the last wee while, but you can see this in Caithness Horizons, or rather, as it's known, the North Coast Visitor Centre. Um, it's a 10,000 piece Lego block, which uh, we had lots of fun with. We did, we did several outreach events with children from across Caithness. Every school in Caithness came to see this block. We did some Minecraft outreach events, which was a lot of fun. Uh, you can see um, here, that is, the, that is the week before I started university in Glasgow. So uh, again, pretty much an amateur, not really sure what I'm talking about. Um, but I think the kids have a lot of fun, actually. It was really great. In fact, I know this because we got one feedback sheet that said, this is the best Lego broch in the world. And that was great. I was thought, that's fantastic feedback. Until my friend pointed out, yeah, Kenneth, it's also the only Lego broch in the world. So uh, as I kind of, uh, was uh, working with the children uh, from a number of schools, this quote stood out for me. Uh, and we're going to come back to it at the end of the talk. When you told me how, how big a broch was in real life, we're going to come back to see what Summer Soul finished that with, what the answer to that was, what happened. We also organised a number of uh, excavations with the UHI and ORCA, uh, two excavations at two broch sites, which were pretty sterile, I have to say. But then we did an, a site at which could have been Iron Age, Bronze Age, even kind of uh, medieval or early medieval. We, we weren't too sure. Um, probably Bronze Age, though, uh, on balance. Uh, this was attended by a number of really first-time archaeologists and enthusiasts, and it was really quite fine stretch, and they had a great time. We found some hammer stones there. Um, that there is a pig's canine, uh, which would suggest that it is quite a high-status site, because it seems that the rulers of the time quite enjoyed their sausage rolls. Uh, we did think it was a talon to begin with, but yeah, pig's, pig's tooth. We did also find... Um, that uh, uh, hearth just after two days of digging. So this was a really great site and we'd love for this, uh, we'd love to return actually at some point. So it was really a really fun day. The weather obviously helped too. More recently, we've been doing um, archaeological outreach events. That's me dressed up as Wattie, Wattie the Loch Bottom Monster. Uh, who really exists, by the way. You have, to, you have to be there at a certain time of day to see it. But we went through the Seven Wonders of Watton, which were just seven archaeological sites near Watton Primary School. So we looked at a stone circle, which no longer exists. We looked at cairns, we looked at rocks, of course. We looked at medieval chapels. We even looked at a World War II prisoner of war camp, which was actually used for some pretty uh, high-ranking Nazi officials um, in Watton. So it was all kind of there to see, and um, hopefully kids really enjoyed to learn. So we've been really keen and really upfront with uh, our outreach activities. Moving on from that, we did sort of, sort of larger projects and more permanent um, uh, amendments to the landscape. This is uh, Akvarasdale Brock in Caithness, which was infested with giant hogweed for any green-fingered there, um, green-fingered folk out there. Uh, this is, can be pretty nasty. It can actually cause burns to children, animals, uh, just basically if you get it on your skin and the sunlight reacts with it. So we were keen to cut that out. So we turned it from this into that. 
So hopefully uh, much more enjoyable, much more kind of aesthetically pleasing as well. I don't want to say historic Scotland if I, there is a certain aesthetic um, beauty in, in this kind of space. Um, more recently, and perhaps today, our largest project is the Owsdale Broch project project. Um, perhaps some of you have visited or perhaps some of you have seen this online, what we've been up to. But here's the Broch as myself and Ian, sorry, as, as Ian saw it in 2013. And then when I came down to see the Broch with Ian, because he was ranting and raving about this excellent Broch, it was described by Colleen Beatty as uh, a well-preserved Broch and um, in the Architectural Guide to Caithness as the best preserved Broch in Caithness. Well, I had high hopes and high expectations, but when I came down to see it in 2015, this is what it looked like. Uh, and as you can see there, the buttress to the right of that opening, um, so to the right of the tree is the entrance, and to the right of the entrance, you'll see a uh, kind of uh, stonework buttress projecting out. To the right, you see a, a cell. That stonework was created by James Mackay, the rock's original excavator in 1891. Um, it's funny to think that something that was standing for barely over a hundred years uh, collapsed whilst the majority of the structure, which was built over 2,000 years ago, still stood the test of time. So there it was, and there we are with Historic Environment Scotland's uh, Nick and Simon, who gave us the all clear to go ahead and pursue a project to um, conserve this rock. And as you can see here, it's looking a lot better, a lot safer. We had to cut out the tree, of course. Um, to medal with a lot of stonework. It was a you know a project that took a lot of time and a lot of a real group effort because it wasn't just uh, the broch. We also had a car park made uh, because there was no car park. Such a good car park that not only one but two caravans were fly tipped on it within the first couple of months of that car park being um, established. We also had a, a kilometer long path created along from the car park down to the broch. Uh, this this uh, path skirts past the uh, post medieval clearance village of Borg. Uh, and with a name like Borg, you might think that it, it's it's in some way related to, to the Broch. It is indeed because Borg is the Old Norse for Broch. Um, so this, this, this settlement may well be much older than, than uh, the 1800s. Uh, and it's a very, you know, very um, interesting place to visit, I think, very atmospheric. Uh, we had some really great uh, interpretation panels which tell you all about the history of the Broch, about the, the, the history of the Ord where the Broch is located, one of the most dangerous stretches of road in the lap part of the 19th, the early part of the 20th century until it was um, a new road was created there. But more than more than anything else, I think it's really wonderful that we managed to find pictures of people who lived at the Broch. Uh, John McLeod is on the left hand side there. He was born in 1795. And I think it's wonderful that we have a picture of someone who lived there, born in the 18th century, and who also looks utterly terrified of the camera. Um, I believe, I cannot quite remember the, the lady, that's his wife on the on the right hand side, It's I think it's Christina. Um, but yes, I think it's amazing that we've got a record of that. So please do visit Ousdale Brock if you can. Um, it's really our crowning achievement thus far, but it's not what we are so we're not stopping there, essentially. We want to build a full-scale broch in Caithness, and that's what the next part is going to be about. Uh, this is the part that Ian would normally present, and he talks much more eloquently about the structures and the building of a broch, because he is an, a self-employed builder by trade, uh, as well as being a massive broch nerd. So he's usually far more eloquent when it comes to this, but I'll try my best to fumble. Um, first thing to point out is that these um, drawings, uh, these kind of the very realistic 3D drawings that you made were, were kindly donated to us by Bob Marshall. I absolutely recommend you go and check out some of his work. Just go search for him on Twitter, Facebook, on, on, online. Uh, smashing guy, really highly rated. And you know, I think you'll agree these are quite stupendous images actually, and really give a, a sense of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, but he's kind of created a 3D model of what we're trying to do. So um, here's an example of it. It's, this is a slightly earlier version. Um, than the kind of the kind of dark colours that you might have seen earlier, uh, but essentially this didn't quite start on the back of a fag packet, but really it had to start somewhere. And this this really started with uh, a block symposium in 2017, which we held with a number of esteemed archaeologists and heritage uh, conservationists, uh, traditional skills folk, uh, drystone dikers, um, all sorts of people. We had about 20, 25 people from across the UK 
from various universities and organisations attend a symposium about our design. So Ian had made this design, um, and essentially out of that, we thought we were going to have you know lots of, lots of arguing uh, with with archaeologists not able to agree on one one idea because they do tend to have different ideas about things, which is great. But we were worried that we might get stuck a little bit with our, our, our archaeological interpretation and um, realism of our design. So Ian presented this, and actually the archaeologists said, you know what, this is your own block, really. Uh, it's your design. This looks fine to us. It's got all the key features of a block. It's cool. So that was really great. Um, it has to be a tourist attraction as well, of course. So we've kind of added bits on, which we'll go over uh, to. Um, but really, we were we were keen to make sure that we drew from the past to inform our design, and so that we've got a story to tell people as well. So it's not just that we've gone and designed this off our own accord. We've actually taken um, elements and features from other blocks, um, such as the triangular lintel. By the way, is the same dimensions from the triangular lintel that you'll find at Culswick Brock in Shetland. The, the kind of the relative silhouette or the kind of shape and the kind of um, size and angles is is roughly the same as Dunthelve and Glen Elk. And the doorway is the same size for, for Cairn Leath. It's quite useful to find a doorway which kind of matches the, the kind of guidelines for, for building regulations as well. So we had to find something that, which, which matched that too. Because bear in mind, this is not only an experimental archaeological project which seeks to promote traditional tracks skills and, and, and learning about the past, but it has to, it has to act as a, as a tourist, tourist attraction. It's almost like a theme park, if you like. Um, but we have again, you know, we've used the, the most up to date kind of evidence that we have for Brocks. Uh, this, sorry, this is a bit of a blurry image, but it's taken from the Cairns Brock in Orkney, which has been led by UHI and um, overseen by uh, Martin Carruthers, who, we, who, we, who again, if you're looking for a speaker about Brocks, is far more eloquent, far more um, learned on Brock things than I am. So I would definitely recommend him because he has such a way with words when he talks about Brocks. Well, we've used his floor plan, or we've used the Cairns floor plan, essentially, to inform our design. Um, we've gone with a kind of mid-how design for, for um, our block. You'll enter into quite a dark, gloomy um, kind of space, perhaps lit by a few candles, uh, but separated and delineated by a number of these um, flagstone plants, almost stood upright, these orthostats, which will help support the second floor. But it's all about a kind of sensory, almost like a sensory deprivation, I think. But it helps to understand that, uh, that, that the, the Brock here is kind of separated into different rooms, there's different functions, there might be different uh, skills and um, um, activities going on. And perhaps people will be able to have a go, or it might just be demonstrations. But you can see here that we tried to split them up. We've got a hearth there at the kind of um, in the foreground. We have a, a tank which might be used to hold water, perhaps it's used to hold. Um, crustaceans, like you can see that in Scar of Bray, certainly, but I'm not sure which Brock this refers to. But we've got a well there too, which you can find at so many sites, such as uh, Hill of Works and Life, uh, Caithness, um, Gardness, amongst other sites too. Um, that's likely not to be open to visitors, I don't think. But the first floor will be open to visitors, certainly. So we have a, the internal staircase. Um, it doesn't go all the way to the top, and I think Myself and Ian had differing ideas about this because I wanted people to be able to get to the top to, have a view, to, see, to see the view essentially. Because you think about when you go on holiday, um, you might go and climb a church tower or uh, you just want to get a nice view. And I thought the Brock would lend itself well to that. But Ian looked at the kind of the archaeological records about what was really what, what we had, which suggested that. Um, you could get all the way to the top. And really, it's only Musa. And as I said before, Musa has been somewhat meddled with in the past. Um, and so it's a good time to quote Niall Fojat when it says that, yes, Musa is a broch, but not every broch is a Musa. And we had to go with the fact that, the, as I mentioned before, the, the way that the roofs batter in eventually comes to, to meet one another at the top. And so from there, we just decided that we wouldn't have access to the, the, the second floor. Um, as you can see here, here's an example of that, of those two walls eventually converging on one another, which would suggest that not all blocks, and certainly most blocks, couldn't um, be uh, accessed to the, to the wall head, essentially. Um, in terms of the internal arrangement, the internal fittings, we will look to use um, clay water the daub, uh, perhaps some amount of timber. Of course, Caithness by the Bronze Age was pretty largely treeless, actually. So we'll have to be fairly uh, Spartan in how we use 
timber fittings and joinery. Um, but their evidence exists over in Clach Toll uh, as a kind of uh, reed matting and a, a wattle and daub uh, interior structure. So it's not just all about the stone, there is going to be lots of uh, other skills involved in making these things and being able to describe what was available to our Iron Age ancestors, <coughs> how they would have utilised it. And of course, there's hopefully there'll be activities going on which will help to get people you know, that kind of hands-on learning. Um, perhaps they'll be able to build walls, perhaps they'll learn to you know, um, um, use Willow to create um, baskets, things like that, or even walls. I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunities for people to get involved in the actual construction of this, but I'm also thinking about ancillary projects and activities which can which can people can do as they visit the, the brook. Uh, as I said, the third floor won't be accessible, um, but you will have this fantastic space on, once you're on the first floor after you've entered this kind of gloomy, industrious, almost uh, maybe um, agri almost agricultural, perhaps in some in some instances, bottom floor. Once you get to the second floor, it's going to be a lot much more airier. It's going to have a beautiful view, I think, of the of the roof above, and it's going to be quite an experience. Um, so there's the, there's there's the what it's going to look um, like from above, which you won't be able to see, of course. But we're thinking that you know brocks brocks could be multi were multi-story and they could be multifaceted in their use. There's nothing to really suggest that they were simply used as houses. You find at Clacht Hall, for instance, the remains of nine to twelve uh, quern stones, um, and the fact that um, the, the fact that their very existence might suggest that brocks were in some way used for for not only living in but also used for various practices activities such as grinding grain or perhaps even storing grain some people some people have suggested that brocks were basically large grain silos because you think about what your wealth was back then it's, it's going to be cattle it's going to be sheep but also grain is going to be terribly important too to these kind of agricultural societies um, so there's a view from it from the bottom i think it'll look really quite impressive um, and there's the, an example of kind of what we're looking for. We've got a workshop area, we've got a courtyard, but we have a number of other buildings related to the Iron Age and two Brock villages as well, which will help to give people a sense of what life was like in the past and what the Iron Age was like and what people were doing, what, what kind of houses, structures they were living in, uh, how they lived in them, whether they were even houses. Uh, there's a number of um, avenues that we can take in terms of exploring the past through this Brock. And of course, as I mentioned, there'll be plenty of activities to get, get involved with. And I think we've taken real inspiration from the Cranog Centre for this because they are really quite um, brilliant at extending that dwell time, extending, you know, giving people um, something to do, something that, that really immerses you in life in the Iron Age. So that is it. I, I'm, I think I've surpassed my own expectations by, by rattling on in 46 minutes. Uh, about brochs. This is what we want to achieve. We think it's no less than Caithness deserves and uh, we're committed and enthusiastic as ever. If you'd like to know more, then there... Oh, sorry, I, did, I nearly forgot. If you'd like to know more, by all means, check us out online. But coming back to why we kind of started this and why we do this, I think archaeology has the power to really inspire and to shape lives and communities. And so I think this is summed up by Summer Soap when she says, when you told me how, how big a book was in real life, my head blew off. So there you go. Thank you very much for listening.